This video is sponsored by World of Warships. At the height of the morn, the sun pierced its cloudy prison to cast its radiant gaze upon Captain Johnny P. Ritt, the scourge of the seven seas. Squinting through the brilliance of molten gold rays, the young pirate swaggered along the length of his schooner, every second step proclaimed by the resonating clunk of his peg leg on weathered timbers. The splashing sea sent sparkling salty spray, showering the sun-soaked smiling sailor, accenting his striking pose like a badge of valiance. At the bow of his ship, the aspiring pirate's eyes locked into his approaching prey. The prized galleon of the Spanish treasure fleet, and soon to be first big score as captain of the Flintlock Fiends. With a wave of his hand, these poor rapscallions would bear witness to the wrath and judgment of his schooner's payload. All that was left to invoke his trial by iron and flame was one word. FIRE! While the adventurous tales of Bartholomew Roberts, Francis Drake, and Blackbeard paint a tantalizing picture of life plundering booty on the high seas, the gods of statistics and reality are always there to remind us that pirate life was much more likely to be as successful and abrupt as our little friend Johnny's here. As for every pirate who succeeded in finding riches, there were dozens more who ended up as pathetic, wretched, miserable failures. Sometimes in many pieces. That's right, we're talking piracy. Of the seafaring variety. So cock your flintlocks and chase some parrot flocks because today we're gonna talk about the worst pirates you've never heard of. There, buddy, what you got there? A pirate ship? Oh wow, are those cannons? Yeah, I'm gonna be the most dangerous pirate on the seven seas. Yeah, let me hear your best yarg. Yarg! Wow, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, good luck. <laughs> dreams of sailing a cannon-packed pirate ship are fun and all, but it's not as fun as crushing those dreams in World of Warships. World of Warships is a free-to-play naval game packed with tons of battleships, destroyers, and submarines that'll run circles around anything from the Age of Sail. With over 40 unique maps, dynamic weather, and top-notch graphics, World of Warships delivers an authentic naval experience that's constantly fed with new monthly content releases to ensure things never get stale. But I know what you're thinking. Where's my spinach representation? Don't you worry champ, they had a Popeye update just for you. With over 600 different giant slabs of metal to choose from, you'll never get bored flinging hypersonic metal shards at yet more giant slabs of metal. You can dive in as a lone wolf or in a team with your friends and conquer the high seas on not only PC, but consoles as well. So click the link in the description to download World of Warships today, and if you're really cool, use my promo code BRAVO to receive a huge starter pack with 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium account time, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. Thank you, World of Warships, for sponsoring the video. It's 1717, the golden age of piracy, and Major Steed Bonnet set sail for the first time as a pirate captain. And also for the first time ever. There were numerous ways one could find themselves pirating during the Golden Age. Many were poor sailors seized by dreams of riches and freedom. Others were normal sailors seized by pirates for their riches and freedom. And some were seized by the Royal Navy before seizing command to seize riches and freedom. Bonnet, on the other hand, had an origin unlike most others, in that he did not come from mediocrity, but rather aristocracy. Steed Bonnet grew up in Barbados on a wealthy estate of over 400 acres of sugarcane fields, which he inherited at the young age of six after his parents passed away. Now, you might think growing up on a farm would build the sort of rugged and handy character necessary for swashbuckling piracy, but <laughs> this is the 1600s. Uh, okay, I know this looks bad. Yeah, 94 African slaves doesn't really scream tolerant. <gasps> no, that's not fair. I have three whites as well. A socialite of society, charmer of faint hearts, Major Steed Bonnet was known to be a proper gentleman. But don't let that major deceive you. He got that from the Barbadian militia, which was essentially just a bunch of landowners who hunted down runaway slaves. Uh, like I said, with his wife and four kids, he was all set to cruise the Lazy River equivalent of the good life. But all that would change one fateful day when he decided to take a detour. It's 8 in the morning. Ah, oh, that can't be right. The life-sucking vampires would be back in their coffins by now. Yet instead, here you are, sucking down Madeira wine like it's the first job you've ever had. Well, Mary, I just thought it was about time someone did some sucking in this house. <gasps> and it's pronounced Madeira. Oh, go down to the harbor if you want to gargle the Spanish so much. Portuguese, Mary! It's Portuguese! From the subtropical archipelago of Madeira, which, spoiler alert, is in the name! If you put half as much thought into this house 
asshole that you do the bottom of a bottle, oh, here we go. Then Mr. Peppers would still be alive. How was I supposed to know the dog couldn't tuck and roll? Because who launches a dog 60 feet in the air with a sugarcane trebuchet? He had a dream, Mary. What? A cherished aspiration or ambition. I, I know what a dream is. Then why'd you ask? Mr. Peppers died? Because I wasn't sure if I just heard the most ridiculous five word sentence in my life since I said, yes, I will marry you. Oh, that's just, you're a five word sentence. George, I swear to God, if you touch my wine glass, I will force feed you rose thorns. Sorry, sir. I also need you to go pick some rose thorns. Of course, sir. In a very bonkers and Blue Jay approved midlife crisis, Bonnet decided to spontaneously abandon his life to become a pirate. Many sources claim it was because he was tired of his nagging wife's constant yapping. Others speculated it was due to the stress from having lost a child. And some theorize that the avid bookworm was captivated with wonderlust of the pirate life from the novels of the time. But whatever the reason, I think it was pretty clear that our little steed had a bee in his bonnet per se. So despite having literally no seafaring experience, he set off to kickstart his new career on the high seas. Typically the first thing every new pirate had to do was steal a ship, but that sounded like a lot of poor people work to steed, so he just bought one instead. After getting the other essentials like cannons, ammunition, and a private library in his personal quarters, all he had to do was wrangle himself up a crew. Hello good sir, uh, uh you seem to be of the rather swashbuckly sort. Ahem. <clears throat> How would ye like to join me pirate crew, yarg? Pirate? What, because I have a parrot? That's kind of fucked up, man. What, it can talk? <laughs> no, no, it just knows that one phrase. That's kind of unsettling. What, is your monumental ego threatened by the mere idea that something you see as just an animal could possibly be more intelligent than you? Or are you just surprised by the fact that someone told you no for the first time in your privileged life? Or perhaps is this reaction just an outlet for how unsettled you are your own life circumstances as a whole, spanning from the obvious contention plaguing your marriage to the palpable insecurities encompassing your fostered resentment at the predetermined trajectory of your affluent life? Okay, maybe two. Brock? After gathering a crew, Bonnet kept up his tradition of breaking pirate tradition by paying them a salary from his own fortune as opposed to the norm of just splitting shares of plunder. With all his boxes checked, the gentleman pirate snuck out of his home, out of the island, and out of a family that he would never see again. Adjusting to the pirate life aboard the Revenge would have been rather interesting for Bonnet. Instead of his usual lavish courses of veal, caviar, and gummy worms, which I only assume are staples of every wealthy man's diet, he would have had to settle for slabs of salted meat dry biscuits, and whatever other critters they can scrounge up whilst plundering booty. <laughs> oh, how cute. I think I'm gonna call you Donatello, which isn't a reference for anything yet. No, it's not. <laughs> That's good, but I think he's more of a bow staff guy. The pirates started their hunt around the East Coast, where they found some success at first, capturing a handful of ships without a fight and releasing them after they were debootified. Except for the Barbadian ones, which, in order to keep word of his activities from reaching home, he burned to the ground. <laughs> Even with a profitable start, Bonnet's inexperience really started to shine in these encounters, and the crew began to lose what little respect they had for the gentleman pirate. But hopefully, all that was about to change as they spotted a massive Spanish merchant ship on the horizon and raced Interceptor with their Jolly Roger raised high. This is it, Peter. The big score. Set the blowy sheets to max and let's get this booty, yarg! Blowy sheet. Full sail. The men say full sail. Uh, sorry, and these men pay your salary? Blowy sheets to max, men! Davy Jones, that's no merchant vessel. It's be a Spanish man of war! <clears throat> I mean, Peter, come on. We've all dabbled in red light districts. What? Not a man of whore, man of war! Uh, listen, I I'm not one to judge, but if you're into being eaten, just don't do it on company time. No, not man of war, man of war! <gasps> Cortez himself? He's here? What? How did you get conquistador? The pirates quickly realized they weren't facing a merchant vessel packed with luscious amounts of shiny metal, but a Spanish man of war packed with scary amounts of deadly metal. The ambitious hunt turned into a rapid retreat as the revenge scurried off faster than Bonnet left his family, but not before the man of war made the sky a lot more inclusive of the periodic table, killing and wounding half of Bonnet's men, including the big man himself. After their escape, the revenge sailed towards the pirate sanctuary of Nassau, where Bonnet would get to network with his new co-workers per se. 
a task our gentleman pirate was well accustomed to. Just like white collar networking events, the biggest criminals stood out the most, and Bonnet found himself making friends with none other than Edward Teach himself. Iconic for his rather dark and fuse filled facial hair, a black beard, if you will. That's right, the arguably least experienced pirate in history struck up a bromance with one of the most notorious pirates of all time. While the early details of their relationship are speculative, we do know that the two captains agreed to sail together. However, with Bonnet's captaining skills being about as competent as his parenting ones, Blackbeard quickly caught on to the man's lack of seafaring expertise and hashed up a plan. Alright, so just hang out in ye quarters here and let me worry about the captaining. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I kind of feel like a lazy prisoner, though. No, no. Think of it as an uh, apprenticeship. You're going to be learning the most important part about being a pirate, Yarg. Low-risk plundering tactics? Uh, Yarg, spot on, matey. And you can learn with, uh, with this. M Monopoly? There be no better way to learn theft than capitalism, matey. Uh, okay, and should I also start sticking lit fuses in my hair? What? Oh, shit! <laughs> wow, that could've been bad. I swear they have a mind of their own. They do? Anyway, to work with ye! Pirating be tough work fit for only the strongest men. Sir, you're, uh, missing ice cream time. You better have saved pistachio! Blackbeard persuaded Bonnet to give up command of the ship and become just a measly passenger aboard it, a change that was definitely a relief for Bonnet's crew. The revenge found a good deal of success under Blackbeard, all whilst Bonnet kinda just hung around awkwardly like an engineer in... Well, pick a social setting. Day after day, Bonnet's command felt more artificial than a Call of Duty code of conduct, but he felt past the point of no return in his pirate life, and even confided in some crewmen that he was tired of it, and would gladly leave it all behind to live life anew in Spain or Portugal. A few weeks later, according to some versions of the story, Blackbeard would get a new flagship and separate from Bonnet after reinstating him as captain. Sailing through the Bay of Honduras, Bonnet and his men soon found themselves face to face with a new prize. A massive 400 ton, 26 cannon merchantman, the Pro Protestant Caesar, a score too attractive for Bonnet to let slip by. Having much more combat experience than his run-in with the Man of War the year prior, Bonnet closed the distance, cut behind his prey stern, and opened fire. Bonnet lost the cannon fight and retreated into the night with his timbers thoroughly shivered, leaving his crew to grow ever more resentful towards their gentleman captain who just couldn't seem to catch a break. After making port, they just so happened to run into Big Daddy again, who proposed Bonnet be replaced by a new captain named Richards, a proposal Bonnet's crew wasted no time time in accepting. Having once again lost command, Bonnet was back to being a puppet, challenging Elmo's record for the longest time spent with a hand up their ass. Fast forwarding a little bit, because believe it or not there are other pirates I want to talk about, both Blackbeard and Bonnet decided to surrender themselves for a pardon, the latter taking a small boat to a town in North Carolina to do so. In 1717, King George I was getting real fed up with the amount of swashbuckling and debootification plaguing the high seas. So, being the buzzkill that he was, he issued a proclamation that provided any pirate who surrendered themselves a one-time pardon for all their various piratey crimes. Therefore, any and all pirates, scallywags, and or marauders who surrender thyselves before the 5th of January in the year of our king, 1718, shall be pardoned one time only for all their crimes. All crimes, you say? Including the most heinous. Does that include stabbing Spanish people? Uh, yes. And all other peoples as well. I don't want a pardon for the French ones. What about eating stolen sushi with a knife and fork? The king will forgive you, but I can't say God will. How about the smearing of copious amounts of butter on doorknobs and or floors to make people sticky? That's... That's not a crime. That's just weird. But what if... Now here's an example of said proclamation in action, as I will now pardon myself for the murder of that little shit. Now I trust you're all done wasting my time. Ah, uh -uh. you said you only get one pardon. Now, is it a good idea to blindly grant pardons to some of the most violent criminals in history? I don't know, is it a good idea to pop three-year expired antacids when you have a stomach ache? Is it? When Bonnet returned to his ship, pardon in hand, he found that Blackbeard had one more surprise in store for him. The legendary pirate was long gone, having taken with him all of the loot, as well as various weapons, provisions, supplies, and the best crewmen. At this point in his life, Bonnet was what we'd call not a happy sailor, and he was said to have developed a mortal hatred for Blackbeard. It's believed he initially sought revenge against his former ally, but he failed to chase him down and would never cross paths with him again. So instead, the man who had just gotten a pardon for piracy, returned to said piracy. 
piracy. But this time, he had a new strategy. To mask his piracy, he would compensate the victims to make his predatory looting appear like a fair trade on paper. Therefore, it's not stealing, it's just good business. Thank you, thank you. Okay, great. Pleasure doing business with you. A an old cable? This is worthless. Uh, uh, uh. The value comes from your imagination. Check this out. Now, can you imagine what I could do with this? Boop. Having been the victim of a stupendous amount of comical blunders, Bonnet had become a lot more violent now, even threatening to kill his own crewmen if they refused to fight at times. But this renewed piracy would be short-lived, as he was soon captured after a lengthy battle with pirate hunters. He was taken to Charlestown, where he was imprisoned to await trial. But luck would strike one more time for our little gentleman pirate, as he escaped captivity to begin his life on the run. Ah, perfect. Oh, I believe you gentlemen have me mistaken for another handsome devil, for I am Duke Jeffrey Snickles of Worthington. How do you do? Yep, that's Steed Bonner right there. Book him, boys. <laughs> Your parrot can talk? <laughs> no, no, he just knows that one phrase. Steed was recaptured after only four days, and despite much pleading from not only him, but also various damsels enchanted by the charms of a gentleman pirate, he was hanged at the gallows on December 10th, 1718. While he met a bitter end, at least he can say that he fulfilled his dream. Hanging out with pirates. Okay, so I had a lot more pirate stories I wanted to talk about, and I didn't really expect Bonnet to steal the spotlight more than he ever did from ships, so let me know in the comments if you'd like a part two. But there's still time left for one more pirate story, and for this one, we'll have to swim on over to the second most iconic pirate sanctuary in history. Somalia. When you think of piracy, you think of plank walking, parrot squawking, booty gawking buccaneers. But don't let Pirates of the Caribbean deceive you. Piracy has been and always will be a thing. While it may change in shape and form, the piracy breeding conditions of poverty and low social status remain constant. And the pirates that plagued headlines from 2000 to 2017 were the infamous Somali pirates. Sure, they lost sex appeal switching out cutlasses and sloops for AKs and rusty motorboats, but it doesn't matter how tetanus prone a pirate vessel gets, you can never scrub out the whimsical buffoonery. Somali pirates took advantage of their 119,090,000 gumball long coastline along one of the busiest commercial trade routes on the planet to capture foreign vessels and hold them for ransom. After the Somali government collapsed in the 90s, foreign powers exploited the unregulated Somali waters for their various dumping and or fishing needs. Hey, what's going on out there? Um, nothing. What's that over there? This exploitation got to the point where foreign fishing in Somali waters surpassed domestic fishing, so local fishermen took it upon themselves to start defending their resources by capturing and robbing invading vessels. Seeing the potential in this practice, things rapidly escalated into the ransoming shenanigans that we're more familiar with today. But if we learned anything from Archduke Ferdinand's driver, it's that things don't always go according to plan, and what might start off as one small mistake on paper can quickly unfold into disastrous results. Such was the case for a group of Somali pirates in 2000. 2009, who set off on a routine capture of a merchant vessel. In the cover of the night, they snuck up on their target in two skiffs and began firing their small arms to intimidate the crew and prep them for boarding. But something was different about this attack. This merchant ship wasn't behaving how it was supposed to. Instead of maneuvering in an attempt to shake off the attacking pirates, it started heading towards them to respond. This was probably due to the fact that this was not a vulnerable cargo ship. This was the Somme. The French command ship for all naval forces in the Indian Ocean. Whoa, <laughs> didn't see you there. In the darkness of the night, the pirates mistook the silhouette of the Somme to be a civilian merchant vessel, so it started off as a routine assault quickly turned into a hasty escape for their lives as the French warship began its pursuit. The skiffs split up, forcing the Somme to pursue one of them for an hour before they finally surrendered and were arrested. You can probably imagine the French crew got a good laugh out of this. I mean, Somali pirates and glorified canoes attacking a warship in the middle of the night was probably the stupidest thing to ever happen to them. Until six months later, when it happened again. <laughs> again? <laughs> you guys. Like a blind person with a bow and arrow, the pirates kept hitting the wrong target, again accidentally attacking the French warship in the night before they realized their mistake. But as we all know, blind people are very easy to tackle, so while they tried to run, the Somme gave chase and promptly captured them. Now, you're probably waiting for me to say this happened yet a third time, and you'd be wrong.
This has happened like dozens of times. And not just with this ship, mind you. I found stories of pirates attacking warships from not only France, but from Spain, America, the Netherlands, Kenya, and so on. Now, accidentally attacking a military tanker you thought was a cargo ship is a little understandable. But accidentally attacking a Florial class frigate sporting what is clearly a 100mm ticket to the afterlife is a conversation I really wish I could have overheard. Uh, are we sure this is a cargo ship? Yeah, look, you can see the containers right there. Uh, what about that long-angled tube pointed precariously outward as if in an aiming fashion? Oh. Well, that's obviously a pool noodle. Pool noodle. What ship has a 30-foot-long pool noodle sticking outside of a big box? I don't know, Dan, a water park supply ship for fat Americans? Just fucking grab the AK and let's steal some floaties. Again, in 2009, Somali pirates mistakenly attacked the French frigate, uh... Nive, assuming it was a merchant vessel. But to be fair, this time the French were being a little devious. They had positioned themselves in the sun to try to lure the pirates in before capturing all 11 of them. So I guess if the sun was truly shining in all Apollo's glory that day, I can kinda buy a few dudes in a little boat trekking through the waves of an open ocean not making out a warship until the last second. But there's really no excuse for the time in 2006 where Somali pirates were faced with not one, but two US Navy warships and still decided to fight. An American destroyer, the USS Gonzales, was on an anti-piracy patrol when it spotted what looked like a pirate mothership on the horizon. It was joined by the missile cruiser, the USS Cape St. George, who both trailed the oblivious pirates until dawn. They then sent boarding teams and inflatable boats to investigate, but once the Somali buccaneers noticed them approaching, they decided to open fire on the boarding parties from nearly point-blank range. The Americans returned fire as they retreated, but this was only the tip of the batshit insane iceberg that was these pirates' decision-making skills, as they then decided to shoot their AKs and RPGs at the American destroyer and missile cruiser. Hey, so this is a destroyer, right? Correct. Short for torpedo boat destroyer, actually. They were invented to specialize in destroying specifically smaller vessels. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Fulfilling its ancient duty, the American destroyer made short work of this battle, igniting a skiff in American hellfire when its tracer rounds hit a fuel drum. This seemed to be just the stimulant the other pirates' prefrontal cortexes needed to finally engage, as they then decided to surrender after leaving just a few scratches on the warships. It's really hard to imagine what the, you know, game plan was for these Somali pirates. Maybe they thought they could intimidate and confuse the Americans for just long enough to make a quick escape. Or maybe they were looking to commit suicide in a way that was most expensive for American taxpayers, but perhaps their full plan hasn't been realized just yet. While 12 captures and one kill were tallied, a Somali pirate spokesman said that 27 pirates had gone out to sea. So my theory is that the remaining 14 had snuck aboard the American ships, slowly integrated into the military industrial complex, and have been creeping their way up through government ranks so that one day they could maybe, just maybe, have enough power to reinstate Johnny Depp as Captain Jack Sparrow in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, the one and only king of the pirates. Godspeed, Somalia. Wacky pirates. 12 out of 10 stars.